Amen. All right, get with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you want to grab a Bible from a basket scattered throughout here, it would be on page 932. We're doing a series right now, looking at relationships and looking at love and just recognizing that this is such an important feature of of what it means to be a believer and what we want to do as a church. And so we're camping out on it for multiple weeks, and we're just looking at this section of Scripture to try to help us get our bearings and learn what God is like and what he demands from his people. So if you have a Bible, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm going to read the entire section again, and then we'll pray and we'll get to work. Um, We do this because we believe the word is powerful. So let's read, and I'm going to pick up the last verse of, of chapter 12. Here we go. Yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now that you would speak to us through your word. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as your people to love you and to love other people. Help us, Lord, to be a community that is marked by this tangible, real expression of love uh, that that we want to be flowing freely through here. We we want you to change our hearts. Turn us uh, away from love of self and toward love of you and love of other people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Love is nitty-gritty. We can sit around here and go, look, we want to be a loving community. We, we love each other. But this reminds us love has some teeth to it. It's, it's something that actually shows up. This tells us love does certain things and doesn't do certain things, and it clearly spells that out. So when we talk about being love, loving people in a loving community, we're able to see here there's, there's real definition to it. There's a real way in which we can express love to each other. And so we're going to just take each phrase one at a time and work our way through it. The first thing that we see here is that love is patient. Love is patient. Love has the ability to look at other people and to recognize the growth process could be very, very, very lengthy. Now, we're in a society and we're a people who love instant gratification. We want things done right now. We want them done even yesterday. We just want things done. And when we look at people and we have expectations for them, you ought to be growing in God's grace in this way. You ought to be this kind of a person on a ministry team. You're my kid. You need to behave this kind of way. You're my employee. I want you to to do these different things. I want you to perform. We're an impatient people, but love, love is patient. Love looks at other people and recognizes the, the, the reality that God is at work. And sometimes that work is very incremental. And sometimes that work is very slow. And sometimes that work is a couple steps forward and a few steps back, but God is moving us toward Christ-likeness. And love, then, is the ability to look on other people and to say, I will be here with you and for you for a long time. So whether or not you are improving, whether or not you're meeting my expectations, whether or not I see that proof of growth, I'm committed to you. I'm going to be here and I'm going to love you. So when we say we're going to be a loving community, we're saying, look, we're in this thing together and it might be the slow process of us onboarding a culture of love, but five years from now, I'm going to be here loving you, even if you're unlovely, 
And 10 years from now, I'm committing to, look, Lord willing, we're going to be in this thing together. We're going to love each other. 20 years. So love is patient. Love is able to take a long range view of things and recognize God could be working in the midst of this in very slow and incremental ways, but we are going to commit to loving each other and to be patient. I've been reading a biography on a gentleman named Robert Chapman. I just finished it up. And he was a pastor in London in the 19th century. He was a, a pastor who was well known for love. In fact, when I show my kids the, the book, they're like, Santa Claus, like he had this big beard and he just looked really happy and really gentle with people. And the name of this biography is Robert Chapman, uh, The Apostle of Love. His contemporaries are very famous people, people like Charles Spurgeon, um, Hudson Taylor, Christians who have all kinds of literature written about them and people know them and quote them all the time. But these famous believers looked at Robert Chapman and they said, this man is incredible. This man is incredible. In fact, he is the most loving and gracious individual we've ever encountered. In fact, that's what Spurgeon said. He's the saintliest man that I've ever met. Charles Spurgeon looked on this man, Robert Chapman, and said, I would like to be like him someday because he is so loving and so patient. When he was called to his ministry in Barnstable, the church was fractured. It was a church that was dividing over, over practices. They were, some people wanted it one way, another group wanted it another way. It was this divided church family. And Chapman said, I will come there on this condition. Let me teach the Bible. Let me open the word and just proclaim what's there. Don't impose on me a system. Don't force me to preach your, whatever it is your agenda is. Just let me preach what the Bible has to say and I'll come. And here's the other strategy that he employed. He said, I'm going to commit myself to this project for the long haul. Change is slow. He, doesn't, he didn't come in and say, look, I'm the leader, I'm the pastor, here's everything we're going to do different from here on out. We've got to get together on this one. He just said, look, I'm going to love these people, and I'm going to keep loving them, and that love is going to be powerful, and it's going to change the entire culture of that church. That's what he did. He taught the Bible, and he loved people. And sure enough, it changed the church. Not everyone was on board. Some of them... Uh, split off and started their own thing, but the church itself and Robert Chapman and his influence became well known over all of Europe and, and really over all of the world. And so the proof of it was that uh, one time an American wrote a letter to Robert Chapman, but didn't properly address the envelope. On the envelope, it just said, Robert Chapman, um, University of Love, which, by the way, that's not even a real thing. They were just acknowledging, if you go hang out with Robert Chapman and his church, it's like going to school to learn about love. They just said, Robert Chapman, University of Love, London. And you know what happened to that letter? It got delivered. Because they knew, everyone knew, this guy loves people, his congregation loves people. They became well known for their love and their patience. And so what I'm suggesting to us is that we would become a patient and loving group of people. What if we were patient with our kids? What if we were loving and patient with the people that we work with, where we're not going in and saying, come on, guys, shape up. Can't you get with the program? We would be patient and gentle. What if we were a, a church where, where patience marked the way that we dealt with one another? that people who are slow in the process of growing in grace, that we're committed to them, and we don't have this fast-track plan where they need to move on, where they need to grow or move on. We just love people. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever received was from a biblical counselor, and he, he was talking about ministry, and he said, no matter how successful you get, make sure that you always have a couple people that you're dealing with that are really, really slow in the growth and grace process. That'll keep you grounded. You just keep hanging out with people who are messy and slow in their becoming like Christ. And that'll help you. That'll help you big time. And sure enough, don't, we, don't, don't you feel that as God is maybe speaking to you, that God is saying, let's be a patient community of faith and let's commit to the good of people no matter how long it takes. And listen, we can do this because God has been so patient with us. If you think about your own spiritual narrative and you're realistic, you ought to be able to say, man, God has been very, very patient with me. There have been so many times in my life where I should be much further along than I am, and I'm not, and God continues to gently and patiently correct me and steer me toward himself. Isn't that true? I mean, even if you've grown up in the church, that, that story, at least that's been my story, but I think most of us can say, God has been incredibly patient. That's the way that he works. Just think with me about Moses. 40 years in the palace, 40 years in the desert wilderness, 80-year-old getting his ministry assignment. That's the kind of God that we deal with who's saying, I'm not going to fast track this thing. I'm working in the midst of all of this to bring about glory for my son. So let's be a patient people who love well 
and are persistent in our love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Look at verse 4. Love is kind. Love is this ability to have a tenderness and a gentleness, to be able to speak words that are building up. There's this kindness about love. Lewis Smedes calls it this. He says, kindness is the power to move someone who's self-centered toward the weak, the ugly, the hurt, and to invest in personal care with no expectations of reward. Love, when it shows up, it moves toward people who are in need. It says, look, I don't expect you to pay me back. And I don't see something in you that's an advantage to me. I'm just going to be kind to you. I'm going to move toward you and I'm going to speak words that build you up. And I'm going to say things in a way that's tender and compassionate. And I'm going to do that with a gentleness. And you might hear that and go, oh, that's not my personality. And I'm not even sure that's a good idea. If we really want to move stuff forward as a church, we better just like take some leadership initiative and just make things happen. If people don't want to be a part of that, that's on them. But let's just make this happen. Kindness just kind of feels like wimpy. It feels like, are you sure that's what you want to be doing? But, but um, man, kindness is hard. The truth is, it is hard to be kind. And it's hard to be gentle. Ray Ortland puts it like this. Gentleness doesn't lower our standards. It doesn't compromise anything. Gentleness is a very high standard. It's, it's very demanding. Harshness is the thing that's easy. Isn't that true? It's much easier to react and to be harsh and demanding than it is to say, I'm going to love you, and the words that come out of my mouth are going to be words of encouragement, tenderness, gentle, words of kindness. I'm going to love you. That's what we're after here. We want to be a community where words like that are coming out of our mouths, and it is building people up. Robert Chapman, as I told you, he led this church to be a place where love was well known, where people would come in, they'd open their homes, missionaries would stay with them for encouragement. He always had these kind words that he would speak over people. But, but one of the things that was remarkable was how they handled the difficulties with their facility. In fact, the group that splintered off eventually came back to Robert Chapman and the congregation that was meeting in that building, and they said, you guys need to hit the road. You have to vacate the premises. You, we, when we purchased this building as a denomination, we put it in our documents that there were certain things we needed to do, and you're not doing that. You're not meeting the expectations for which the facility was purchased. And Chapman's like, dang, okay. So he goes back to the, to the, to the deed, and he's looking it over, and he's looking over everything, and he goes, guys, they're, they don't have a case against us. They could, we, it's our right to be here. We're not in violation of anything. But he looks at his church and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them the building. We're going to leave here. We will meet in rented locations. We'll give them the building. We'll let them take over. We're going to express kindness to them. We're not going to fight for our rights. We're not going to demand that this is an injustice and we need to stay here. We're just going to gift it to them and move right along. And the whole church was like, all right, we're on board. We'll do that. And they left that facility, and then the church got healthier, and it even grew more. And so then they're looking, okay, we have resources, and we can buy a piece of property. Uh, and they found the perfect location. It was right on a main street, right in a corner of town where they could do some, some social ministry and reach a bunch of people. And they said, we're going to buy this piece of land. It's perfect for us, for our congregation. We'll build our new facility. And they started the process of, of uh, the sale, and they were going through it. And another denomination comes in and says, uh, I'm sorry, guys, we actually have intended to buy this and we're already in the process. And so we're going we're gonna to purchase this land and we're sorry for you guys. And again, Chapman goes to his congregation. He says, here's the story. Uh, this other congregation is coming in and they want to purchase the land and we could fight for it, but I don't think that would glorify God. What if we behave in a way that is loving toward them? What if we celebrate that God is working through them? What if we continue to rent for a season, trusting that God is going to provide for us and celebrating that God is at work in these other congregations? What if we're kind? And sure enough, that's what they did. And eventually they got their own piece of property and they got their own building. But here's the point. They decided and they resolved that they were going to act as Christians through the entire process. A lot of times we can get really messed up because we demand our rights. And as Christians, we don't behave in a way that's ethical or right or godly or loving simply because we want what we want. But love is able to be kind and it's able to be gentle. Now listen, what if we decided that's what we want to be as a people? What if that's the kind of employers we want to be? 
so that people work for us because we look at them in the face and we love them. We speak words of kindness to them. We build them up. And they say, I want to work for you even if it means a pay cut because this environment is so healthy and so good and you actually care about me. What if we were that kind of people? What if we were kind to the coworkers that are so difficult, right? They just grate you and they get under your skin and you're like, I can't, I can't work with these people. But we say as Christians, here's what we're going to do. We're going to love. We're going to continue to be patient and gracious and kind. We're going to love and we're going to just keep loving and we're going to pour out that love freely, even if there's no progress in their growth or even change or even them becoming more humane and more tolerable in the workforce. We just say, this is what we're going to do. What if our homes were marked with kindness? What if, you, what if we came home to places where we just spoke to one another in such encouraging ways that you just feel like, I'm on top of the world. Like, I can, I can conquer anything because I come home to my sanctuary and, and there's just love flowing freely within the family. Kids would thrive. Uh, marriages would thrive. Our church would thrive if we were committed to this idea of loving. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Look at verse 4. It doesn't envy. Envy is when we look at something and we go, that should be me. I wish that were me. When we envy, we're looking at other people, and, and one of the expressions that reveals that we're not loving is when we look at somebody else and we go, I want that. Instead of saying, I'm content, and I celebrate what God's doing in your life. Love is when we're not envious, when we're looking at other people and we're going, that's awesome that God has so richly blessed you and I am totally comfortable in my own shoes. Envy is when we look at something and we go, that ought to be me. Why do they get to do that? Why is it? And we make all of these excuses of why they don't deserve it and why we do. But love is able to be content and it's able to celebrate other people. I was thinking this week about an experience that I had and it's maybe one of the more profound experiences I've had in my spiritual growth. I, I didn't have the normal process of going into ministry. A lot of people will feel called to ministry. They'll go to a Bible college, then maybe seminary. They'll do their formal training on the front end, and then they'll get unleashed on the church. And then they'll have to rethink everything and, and get back on track. But here's my experience. I felt called to ministry at 18, started a sports ministry at 20, realized I was an idiot, and then started doing training. And along the way, I'm still doing ministry and I'm onboarding the training. And, um, and, and I felt like I was learning new things about God and I was getting very excited. I was falling in love with his word and I was falling in love with Church and global missions and a theology of suffering and all these different things. And, and I just felt like, man, this is awesome what I'm learning about God. And I'm so excited to share that with God's church. And it's going to be such an awesome thing for me to be able to do this and, and for God to be glorified through me and my ministry. Here's what I was doing. I'm putting my cape on and I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And I'm going to change the world for God's glory. And then one night I was at my parents' house and I, got, I was on the computer and I was just looking at some stuff I normally look at. And this article shows up and it's a Time Magazine article. And here's what I was doing. I thought that I was unique. I thought I was the only dude, young adult out there who's like falling in love with God like this. And so I'm God's gift to the church. So I'm reading this article and here's what I found out. There's an entire movement. There was this entire movement of people who were getting serious about the things of God that were falling in love with the Bible, falling in love with missions, falling in love with the local church, developing a theology big enough to handle suffering. All of these people were already way ahead of me. In fact, most of them were five to 10 years older than me and five to 10 years further along in their ministry assignments. You know what that did to me? Crushed me. I was sitting there reading an article and I was sad. I was broken over the fact that I'm taking my cape off right now. I'm not the hero in this story. There's a bunch of other people who are already doing this. Isn't that weird? But that's what envy does. It looks at other people and it says, that ought to be me. I ought to be the hero in this story. I should be the one who's doing these different things. Here's what love is able to do. It's able to look at other people and say, if they're doing it, I celebrate it. And if I'm not even a part of it, that's okay. Because God loves me and has called me and redeemed me. And whatever ministry assignment he's gifted to me, I'm going to thrive there. I'm going to live there. I'm going to do that. But envy is dangerous, isn't it? And it shows up in so many different ways. When you hop on social media today, what are you going to do? Do you watch all these, you know, highlight reels of people's lives and you look at these pictures and you're like, are you kidding me? You're on another vacation? Are you kidding? How can you afford, do you ever even work? And you look at these people and you go, how do you get your kids to pose like that? I can't even get my kid to, you know, sit still for a moment. You look at all these highlight reels. Are you going to love people 
Or are you going to envy them and, and go, oh, that should be me and, and be discontent? Because here's what that is. That's unbelief. That's telling God you're not doing a good enough job. You're, you're steering the blessings in the wrong direction. They ought to be over here. And so what we need to do then as a family of God is to commit to, when we hop on social media, it's going to be a spiritual discipline, and I don't believe it's easy, but when we hop on social media, what, what should we do? We should celebrate the gifts of God in the lives of other people. Now that's hard, but here's what I think it would look like. When you see somebody doing something you wish you could do, instead of bemoaning that and saying, man, I wish we could do that. I wish we could afford that. I wish that were me. Instead, what we do is we pray for them. Stop and just pray and say, God, thank you. And this is weird, and it will feel a little bit insincere because I'm still working on this, but here's what we say. God, thank you that you are blessing this individual, this couple, this family. Thank you that they're able to go on a vacation, that you've given them the resources to do that. Thank you that they have an opportunity to grow their marriage and to develop their, their relationship with their kids. And thank you that they're able to experience you in such a beautiful way. What if we stopped every time we saw something and instead of letting envy rule the day, we began to praise God for his blessings in the lives of other people. That's love. And when we train our hearts in that direction, I think it would be very, very powerful. And we would be able then to say, and this is the lot that you've given to me. This is my life. This is the blessed life that you've given to me. When we learn to do that, we become what we call around here gospel-confident people. When we trust that God has given us the station in life that we have, and we see that as his design and his good working to help us, and we celebrate this is where God has us. This ministry, this life, these relationships, these people, this amount of resources that we have, and we just say, God, thank you. And even if there's things that you feel, you know, oh man, I wish I were taller. I wish I were more athletic. I wish I were, and you just say, but no, 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 no. God has given me this and he did it on purpose. He did it very strategically. And it's here that God is able to help me to thrive and appreciate his, his goodness in my life. So love is kind. Love does not envy. Uh, let me give you another example. I'm trying to just blow myself up up here so you guys can think through how this plays out in your own life. There's a church called State Line Church and they had the identical timetable of launching. And they're actually people that I know um, right around the same age as me, and we've done a bunch of things together before. And while we were launching this campus, I found out this other church is launching. And we're having meetings on the same days, and we were actually looking at the same buildings. And so I was like, okay, well, we need to sit down. And I sat down with Greg, and we were talking through it, and, and uh, they ended up looking further south and launching their church a little further south from here. And, um, and I remember one night, Ash, we were laying in bed, and I'm looking at my phone, and, um, you know, I follow this church, State Line Church, and I try to pray for them. But I'm looking at their stuff, and um, it was back in the launch phase season. So we're having our meetings, and they're having their meetings. And I look at this picture, and I'm like, they've got T-shirts. We should have T-shirts. They had their logo on the front, and I'm like, that's really cool. And Ash is like, are you kidding me? Is everything that they, is, everything that they do, is this going to rub you like that? And I was like, probably. Um, but we get envious when we're looking at, at these other in, individuals or organizations or whatever the case might be, and here's what we need to do. We need to just take our hearts captive and recognize when we envy, we are not loving. We are only mainly concerned with ourselves. And when we look at other people in our, or in our industry or, or relational networks that we have, and we look at them and we go, I wish I were them. I wish I could do what they were doing. Here's what we're doing. We are envying. We are not loving. It's an expression of unbelief. God, you're not good enough, and you're not taking care of me. Love is able to say, I celebrate you. I celebrate the gift of God in your life, and I am totally comfortable in my skin, in my own shoes. Love helps us to do that. Love does not boast. That's the next phrase that we find here. Love doesn't boast. Love doesn't allow ourselves to just keep pointing and going, look at me, look at me, I've got this thing figured out. Love doesn't boast. It doesn't advance itself. It doesn't advertise itself. Chapman, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't know about him is because he didn't want to be known. He, uh, he actually could have published. He was very famous in his day and age, and he could have published a bunch of stuff, but he just wanted to glorify Christ. 
And while all of his contemporaries were writing books and doing these different things, he just said, I'm just going to love people and fade away into glory. And so he never published a book, and he prevented anyone from ever publishing his sermons or anything that he wrote. In fact, there's only one thing that was written about him. It's the, the collected sayings of Robert Chapman, and that came out after he had passed away. His correspondence that he would write with other people to encourage them, after it was all said and done, he would burn it because he didn't want them to collect it and make something big out of him. He wanted to glorify Christ. Love does not boast. It doesn't say, look, I'm important. Let me show you how important I am. Love deflects away from us, and it deflects to glory in God and to the good of other people. Love cares deeply, not about our reputation or us. It cares about what God is up to in the world. I'm, I'm trying to wrap up quickly here. Love is not proud. It's not proud. One of the conflicts that I think often comes up, one of the reasons why so many relationships are broken and workforces are broken and, and families are broken is because of our pride. When we want to be right, we do a lot of harm. When we know that we're right and we just want other people to be aware of it, we do great harm. When we are proud, we might prove ourselves to be in the right, but we are not loving other people. When we go around and we say, it's my way or the hi highway, we are not expressing the love of God. God, he works very differently. He's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You might never be wrong in your relationships, but you are not loving. Alexander Strzok puts it this way, hardly anything is more contrary to the example of Christ, the message of the cross, and Christian love than arrogant self-importance. When we just elevate ourselves and we go, look, I'm the main deal and everyone else is revolving around me, that pride is doing great damage and it is the opposite of love. Love is not proud. Love is humble. Love looks at other people and says, I want what's best for you. I want you to experience goodness. I want you to feel like you're the center of the universe because God has set his affection on you. Love is not proud. Now, if you're tracking with me, here's how I want to wrap up. I'm going to invite the band to come up here in just a moment. But this stuff, loving people is a challenge, isn't it? Aren't we selfish? And don't we struggle with this? And aren't we envious and proud and self-important? The way forward, as I suggested last week, and will probably be my, my closing every week, the way forward, we got to keep looking at Jesus. We have to look at what he's done for us and appreciate and, and live in that, and that'll help us to love other people. John 15, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he put it this way. He was, he was um, helping them to understand what love is and how it works and how to obtain it, and he tells them, here's my command. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Love other people the way that God has displayed his love for you. He goes on to say this, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. The way that we are going to grow in love is when we look at the one who's loved us so well, who's been so insanely patient with us, so tender and kind to us, who wasn't puffed up, but what did he do? He, he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. When you begin to comprehend and, and take hold by faith of what Christ has done for you, you will understand what love truly is, and that love will help you then to love other people. So let's pray that God would help us with that right now. Lord, we acknowledge our own selfishness. We acknowledge that often we're just cruising through life trying to make it work for us, and we're not very loving. But God, we aspire to be a people that are loving. We, just, we, we aspire to be a community that's loving, and we need your help. So in a moment like this, we're going to lift our voices again, and we pray that you would help us to truly believe the gospel, that we would believe your love that was displayed perfectly at the cross of Jesus Christ, and that would change us so we could lay down our lives for other people. Help us to believe. Help us to follow your commands. Help us to be your friend. Help us to love. In Jesus' name, amen.